My name is Chantal Ripp. I am the uh, Interim Research Data Management Librarian here at the University of Ottawa. And we are very excited uh, to be hosting Making Research Data Public, Workshopping Data Curation for Digital Humanities Projects. This workshop was originally developed and delivered at the 2019 Spoken Web Symposium, uh, Resident Practices in Canoes of Sound. It draws significantly upon cases and RDM processes developed and in continued development across the Spoken Web Research Network. We have a lineup of exceptional speakers with us today, and we are looking forward to being able to engage with participants further in the workshop portion. We are amazed to see the breadth of international participation, but we do wanna note in our workshop, we will center the Canadian infrastructure and the Canadian framework in our case studies, mostly. Uh, the data flow model and tools that we will be exploring in the workshop, nonetheless, will lend itself to transnational community building through data curation practices and data sharing. We are delivering this workshop today from the University of Ottawa, which is the largest bilingual, English and French, university in the world. We are located at the heart of Canada's capital in the city of Ottawa. We would like to begin today with a special acknowledgement of the Algonquin Nation, as well as the rich and diverse Indigenous population in Ottawa and the bilingualism of our nation's capital. Nous rendons hommage au peuple algonquin, gardien traditionnel de cette terre. Nous reconnaissons le lien sacré de langue d'art unissant à ce territoire qui demeure non cédé. Nous rendons également hommage à tous les peuples autochtones qui habitent Ottawa, qu'ils soient de la région ou d'ailleurs au Canada. Nous reconnaissons les gardiens de savoir traditionnel, jeunes et âgés. Nous honorons aussi leurs courageux dirigeants d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain. We encourage you to take the time to reflect on the traditional territory you are on, what treaty is it covered under, and your own personal relationship to that land. Feel free to share with us in the chat. So a quick note about today's programming. Uh, you have joined us right now for the plant panel session. Uh, we will begin with the session featuring our speakers with that roundtable presentation. Following the panel, we will have a brief repose and we will reconvene in a separate Zoom meeting to continue on with the workshop portion of today's events. The workshop portion will include presentations as well as breakout sessions guided by facilitators. The program is scheduled to come to a close today for part one, just after 4 p.m. Eastern time. We on the planning committee are committed to providing a safe, productive, and welcoming environment for all meeting participants today. And we ask that you please abide by the following principles during this virtual event. I will share these again at a later time in the chat so that we can keep them at top of mind. One of the goals of making research data uh, public, this workshop is future oriented. We want to make tools and networks developed in the workshop widely accessible through a data primer or a how-to guide for making research data public. A data primer is a genre of technical writing that acts as a how-to guide for ba basic methods of data collection, management, and analysis in the field. Our data primer will focus on the data flow and discovery model as a tool to aid RDM planning across multi-partner geographically distributed DH projects. In the first of this workshops, we'll be listening intentionally to your discussions and descriptions of successes and challenges in areas of your own projects. Our approach then will be to collaboratively author uh, a data primer for DH, which follows the established model of radical collaboration adopted by consortiums such as the Research Data Alliance and Data Curation Network Primers. We will summarize what we hear into a draft of a data primer, and we will all invite you to return uh, next Friday on May 28th to collaborate workshop the contents uh, that we have drafted into its primer. We will credit anyone who participates in the second workshop as a contact contributor, and we will ultimately send a vinyl draft out for peer review through the Portage Network, uh, which is a national network of uh, research data management professionals who will be co-publishing the primer through open access principles and with a Creative Commons license. And without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our esteemed speakers for today's panels and co-presenters and coordinators for the workshop. Uh, Constant Cramson is an associate or assistant professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Ottawa here, uh, a Canada Research Chair in Digital Humanities and Director of the Humanities Data Lab. She co-directs the Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada project. She serves as the Vice President of the Canadian Society for Digital Humanities and as Associate Director for the Digital Humanities Summer Institute. Welcome, Connie. We also have uh, Mikhail Prue. Mikhail Prue is a cultural researcher living in Montreal, where he is a PhD candidate in art history at Concordia University. 
Michaela is a Joseph Armand Bombardier Canada Graduate Scholar and a Joralowski Foundation Doctoral uh, Fellow in Canadian Art History. He researches contemporary art, technology, queers, archives, and the internet. Michaela is part of the team developing the Digital Digital Ar Archive. Here, Scheer is the director of the CFI funded AMP Lab, Associate Professor of English and Principles Research Chair in Digital Arts and Humanities at UBC's Okanagan campus. She leads the UBCO branch of the Spoken Web Shirt Partnership Grant, on which she is a co applicant. Together, she and collaborator Deanna Fong from Concordia University are pursuing research on gender and active, or effective labor in the Vancouver literary communities of the 1960s and 70s. And finally, we have Dr. Uh, Matthew Lincoln. He is the Collection Information Architect at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries, where he designs infrastructure for curators and archivists to express their knowledge as data that could be linked with cultural heritage organizations internationally and used by students, researchers, and developers alike. He earned his PhD in art history at the University of Maryland College of Art and has formerly held positions at the National Gallery of Art, at the Getty Research Institute, and as a technical lead of the Programming Historian. I would now like to welcome Felicity Taylor, our moderator and the head of research support for and special collections here at the University of Ottawa Libraries and the co-applicant of the Shirk Funded Spoken Web Partnership. With Sarah Simpkins and Michelle or Marjorie Mitchell, she has co-developed RDM workshops aimed at humanities researchers and has adapted tools such as the data flow discovery model that we'll see today and the data spectrum for digital humanities context. She has co-led related workshops at the University of Ottawa and at the Spoken Web Symposium. And we also have uh, for the workshop portion today, Felicity will be co-presenting with Marjorie Mitchell. Marjorie is a research services librarian at UBC Okanagan and a collaborator on the Shirk Funded Spoken Web Partnership. With Felicity Taylor, she has co-developed the data flow and discovery model and data spectrum for digital humanities context and has co-led related workshops at the Spoken Web Symposium. And Marjorie has been doing research, or has been supporting research data management since 2015. Welcome all. I will now stop sharing my screen and pass the, the speaking role over to Felicity. Uh, thanks very much, Chantal, and um, thanks very much for all of our speakers for joining us today. Uh, you know, preparing this uh, event has, uh, it's, it's been a, a big uh, undertaking to prepare this event and to shift it onto an online model. And uh, I'm just really uh, excited that it's come to fruition and really happy to see uh, all of the participants with us today. Thank you so much. Well, metaphorically see you. <laughs> um, so the theme of this roundtable panel is learning from examples, DH data curation successes and failures. Um, the, uh, so important kind of context for uh, some of the people who are in our audience today um, is that this, uh, this panel, we, we opened it up to widely to, to registration, but the panel was originally conceived uh, to complement a series of workshops that will follow the panel for some of the people who are, who are here with us today. So some of you have registered for the workshops and some of you have not. Um, and uh, so the way that the panel was uh, brought together was really with the idea that these uh, speakers would give us um, some case studies to chew on while we were working through a data flow uh, tool uh, in the workshop component. Um, and so for this reason, we don't have kind of a Q&A component on this panel. Um, although if there is some time at the end of the session, um, we can kind of go in that direction. But it wasn't uh, conceived with the idea of having a Q&A because the Q&A kind of portion takes place in the workshop section. Um, so that that's uh, just to, to give a little bit more context. Um, and so I also want to say that if you're now thinking, oh, why didn't I register for the workshops, um, you might be interested in looking into the two hour workshop on data management plans that will be offered on June 14th as part of the DHIS, DHSI event research data management for digitally curious humanists. Um, and I'm going to try to drop a link into the chat. And that will take you to uh, the information on that. Um, so the panelists that we have with us today, uh, Karis, uh, Matthew, Mikkel, and Con Constance Crompton, <laughs> uh, uh, we're going to go in that order rather than the order uh, that was in the, uh, the program. And uh, so without further, uh, without further talk from me, I'll just pass the microphone and the screen over to Karis. 
Um, thank you so much, Felicity. <clears throat> and thanks to uh, Constance and everybody who's um, organizing this uh, event and Marjorie Mitchell as well. Um, I just want to share my screen. It's great to see so many people here, like 82, I think. All right, so I'm going to talk uh, today about some of the work that we're doing here at UBCO um, as part of a larger SHRC funded uh, partnership grant called Spoken Web. And so I'll just briefly introduce Spoken Web. I'll introduce the AMP Lab here at UBCO, and then I'll move to looking at how we've been um, working with the uh, digitization of tapes and then um, talk about the involvement of students uh, in that process. Um, I think I called the talk press play, but it actually, um, if I could rename it, I would call it something like making research data public through student-centered research creation. Um, you, uh, Spoken Web, for those who aren't familiar with it, is a shirk funded partnership grant that is a four-year um, grant, the PI, oops, sorry. Um, the PI for that is Jason Camelot at uh, Concordia University, and it's made up of a consortium of 12, more than 12 at this point, uh, partner institutions. Um, it pivots or it responds to a, um, a challenge, which is to say that across Canada and, and really um, at all over the, I think all over the world, there are collections of audio um, materials that are uh, magnetic tape in format, uh, whether reel to reel or cassette that have been, um, that haven't been digitized and are sitting you know, in collections in people's homes, um, uh, in archives, and they are reaching the end of their life cycle, which is pr approximately 50 years. And so Spoken Web um, has responded to that and it pivots around kind of two central points. One is preservation and the other is access. And so the idea is to process these collections, to preserve them, and also to make them public facing to the um, extent possible um, for access and use um, by the public researchers and teachers. Um, and to do so in a collaborative, coordinated way um, through an interdisciplinary way through um, uh, literary historical study, digital development, and critical and pedagogical engagement uh, with those collections. And briefly, the approaches um, that we focus on new forms of historical and critical scholarly engagement, digital preservation and aggregation techniques, asset management and infrastructure to support sustainable access, um, techniques and tools for searching, visualizing, analyzing, and enhancing critical engagement for features relevant to humanities research and pedagogy, and finally, innovative ways of mobilizing uh, digitized spoken and literary records, recordings rather, within pedagogical, performative, and public contexts. Um, one thing I'm, I'll emphasize kind of throughout the process here is that there is a kind of an order to processing the collections and moving through the data preparation, and that I think at UBCO, we've done things a little bit out of order, and I'm gonna explain a little bit why, um, and so maybe some of the pros and cons of doing that, and I'm certainly interested in hearing um, hearing your thoughts on that. And I know some of these spoken web members are in the audience today. I think Rebecca Dowson's here. Um, so she can maybe speak to the ways that um, other institutions in the partnership are moving through the order of, of things, if you will. Um, the AMP Lab here at UBC Okanagan is uh, formerly the Humanities Data Lab founded by Constance Crompton. Um, I uh, became the director of it in 2017 and uh, it's become the Audio Media Poetry Lab or AMP Lab. It is a CFI funded uh, space and supports five principal research, uh, researchers across two faculties and over a dozen graduate and undergraduate research assistants. Um, Spoken Web is the primary uh, research project within the, within the lab. And in that, um, in the lab in at UBC Okanagan, we have uh, a collection of audio tapes. I should say across, across all the partner institutions of Spoken Web, there is a kind of symmetry, if you will, or consistency where each partner institution has a collection um, and there are two co-applicants. One is an archivist or librarian and the other is a scholar, uh, literary scholar. Um, and that's kind of, that's uniform across the, across the partnership. And so at our institution, we have, I think probably the littlest collection of all. Um, it's 166 tapes um, growing 
uh, but it's, again, it's probably the smallest. That's also meant that in some ways we've been able to work through it. Um, it's almost fully processed at this point. Um, whereas I think other institutions have uh, thousands of, of tapes. And so we've been able to kind of work in a different, a different pace and a different order. Um, and, but I think it's, it's unique to each, each institution has a kind of unique process. Um, our collection is difficult. Um, it's small, but difficult is I guess how I would talk about it. Um, it's come to UBCO through donations by individual writers. Um, uh, in, in one case, uh, a writer, a colleague of mine who showed up and, uh, when I said, I think I'd like to start a, an archive of um, old you know, poetry recordings. And she was like, wait, I have a box in my basement. I have to go and get it for you. And she brought up this, this box of tapes and that actually became the um, kind of serendipitous foundation of, or founding of the collection. Um, the artifacts that are in the collection are amateur. So unlike, so in contrast, if you will, to um, a university reading series that has good technical AV support where um, items are labeled, you know, uh, Margaret Atwood reading uh, 1974, June 1st, recorded by, et cetera, um, where there's kind of robust metadata or at least some metadata on the, on the objects. Um, we have uh, amateur home recordings that were made uh, by poets in their living rooms with other poets. Um, they are conversational, they are um, unscripted interviews, they're class recordings where um, a poetry prof or a literature prof would bring um, the, you know, this new portable device into their classroom and make recordings. Um, and so they have different ethical and rights considerations than a, a public poetry reading series made in a university context would. Um, I'm going to move to talking about processing the collections um, and how and how that's been developed across the Spoken Web Partnership. Um, at the beginning, um, one of the earliest things that Spoken Web did was develop a, a custom metadata schema to um, address the kind of specific needs of this these types of of archival objects. Um, in doing so, they drew on the expertise of librarians, archivists, and literary scholars to develop, um, uh, I think through three iterations, uh, the metadata fields that you can see on the right. And they're actually not, there's, there's more of them uh, below. Um, they include fields such as title, production context, genre, location, et cetera. And within each field, um, it's possible to get quite granular in the description. Um, and so you can imagine like for the, the record, like a recording that is a public poetry reading, um, the cataloger, cataloger could enter metadata identifying the producers, um, including like the host, the university, um, the speakers, uh, which would include the poet and, and the host, uh, the date of the reading, the location of the reading, and a lot of that information would be available um, through surrounding archival materials or, or publicly available um, works. Um, I guess what I want to stress is that you know, from, from my perspective, the university produced poetry reading series, the public facing um, recordings are easier, I think, to create metadata for. Um, in the case of our collection, where the tapes are these informal readings, unscripted conversations that took place in people's living rooms um, uh, with multiple speakers, people aren't necessarily identifying themselves. There's only so much metadata that we could enter based on the object alone. And so I wanna give you an example of that. This, <laughs> what is this? Um, this is from a tape, this is a tape from the George Bowering phone. Um, and they're amateur recordings made within artist writer communities. And they have titles like this one, Warren, uh, Warren Roy, Moon, etc. And that's it. Um, we have another one called West Coast with Stan and Gladys. That's from the Warren Tallman phone. Um, and another one from, from that phone called Bob, collage Daphne. Um, and so it, it was really um, a point for us in terms of like the expected workflow process of completing the metadata um, that we the team, which includes um, six at the time, I think six students, uh, where we sat down and went, well, actually, we can't fill out. Um, we can't fill the metadata fields, because we don't know who is moon. Um, 
And so that necessitated that we did things a little bit out of order and that we had to digitize and we had to transcribe and we had to listen in order to figure out like, who's Moon? Um, as it turns out, Moon is the actual Moon in this case. Um, this is one of my favorite tapes and it is um, Warren Tallman, uh, Roy Kiyoka, the uh, Warren Tallman, sorry, is a um, UBC professor who taught at, um, taught at UBC between 1956 and 87, Roy Kyuka is a visual artist, poet, um, member of the writing community. And they are at George Bowering and Angela Bowering's house in Montreal. And they're listening, or they're watching TV rather, um, listening to the moon landing in 1969. And so the moon is the actual moon. We spend a lot of time wondering like, what, what poet do we know whose last name is Moon? Um, and so listening allowed us to figure out that in fact they were recording themselves having a literary conversation um, kind of going off you know off the cuff um, but the background of that um, was the occasion of the moon landing in 1969. Um, so we had to digitize and that interrupted the kind of expected workflow but it also gave us this opportunity um, to train students and do that in, in sorry that uh, digitization in-house and so we opted to um, uh, take, take the opportunity of um, uh, working with colleagues at the DH lab at the University of Exeter and producing a module that would capture the workflow of audio digitization uh, which we had to train and learn our learn ourselves um, uh, and, and develop so we're sort of developing it and capturing it at the same time um, to do that, we uh, hosted uh, first in digitization, uh, a group out of UBC Vancouver um, that uh, came to do a workshop in the AMP lab. And we um, hosted it and learned a lot in that process. Um, and that got us sort of started thinking about the module. Um, and together with the University of Exeter, we and, and undergraduate um, research assistants who worked on that module and also worked on the digitization, um, we began digitizing the collection and also producing this training module that would go with it that would train other undergraduate students um, coming in. And the badge that you see here was also designed by a master student here in digital arts and humanities, uh, Yasmin Lapvizade. Um, the module is badged and available um, to UBC Okanagan students and Exeter students. We also made it available um, to the public on YouTube because there was expression of interest from librarians, um, especially in the public uh, public libraries, about um, wanting to gain that training and expertise to digitize some of their collections. So it's badged um, in-house, but also uh, available publicly. And I can drop the link in shortly. Um, the module itself covers um, it's an introduction. It covers the history of magnetic tape the workflow for digitization, um, assessing the tape condition, setup, threading the reel, um, and finally, uh, digitization. And I'm going to skip, uh, just in the interest of time, uh, the video that I have here. So having started digitizing the collection, um, we were thinking ahead to, and again, a little bit out of order, making research data public through research creation. So we wanted to, I think, you know, if we were to, going to go in the anticipated workflow, that would be something we would do at the end having digitized um, the materials, having made them available. Um, we've always involved students in the AMP lab in both the technical side of um, working with data, but also in the research side. So every, no student is working nearly, nearly if you will, as a tech, um, in technical capacity, they're also working in a research capacity. And so, and that's been somewhat self-directed. So student curators, we think of them as sort of student curators um, who are selecting um, different archival materials that they find especially compelling. Um, we also try to create opportunities for them to do research creation uh, work and make that work public. And so I'm just gonna spend the last few minutes here um, going through some of the examples that we've, um, of that kind of work. So it's, these are all students who've been involved in um, digitizing the collection, um, but they're also as, the second part of their work doing um, uh, doing research creation. So um, as part of that, you'll see the picture here is Felicity, uh, a workshop that Felicity Taylor did with Marjorie Mitchell here in 20, uh, March 2019, 
um, which was called uh, Making Research Data Public Through Research Creation. Um, so we often start with a workshop with an, an expert um, facilitator from within the spoken web network. Um, and then we move to the student's own work. So I'll briefly go through um, some of the film work, podcasting and 3D printing that we've done. Um, the Soundbox exhibition was a 2019 um, work where Evan Berg uh, was commissioned as a student art artist already on the project to work with um, a selected uh, recording, a clip. Um, and in this case, it was something that we could get easy, easy permissions because permissions, of course, is um, the, one of the more important pieces here. Um, so this was a recording of Warren Tallman reading uh, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry and the rights to that were fairly easy to work with the, um, to work with the estate. And um, so Evan Berg produced um, a beautiful video and uh, as a, he's a uh, BFA student um, and did a three day installation at UBC's Vancouver campus that um, involved an artist talk. And I will link that um, so that people can see that on, on YouTube as well, because that's where we've hosted it. Um, we invited Hannah McGregor to do a podcasting workshop with us at UBCO, and she's um, uh, based at Simon Fraser University, where her work is on um, podcasting as public scholarship. And from that workshop, like Felicity's, um, we spent quite a lot of time over the summer doing um, the development work for podcasting, which, as you can imagine, is an ideal medium um, to make some of the data research data public. And so we've selected particular clips from the collection that again, where rights are relatively easy to navigate and um, Soundbox Signals is a podcast um, that's conceptualized around, it's quite simple actually, it's just, it's around what we call curated close listening. So the selection of a clip, um, we get together, we listen to it quite closely and then it's, we generate a conversation um, with the curator and two special guests who join me on the show. Um, it's quite self-contained. It means that we do all of the, we do a lot of the work on the podcast, um, which means it's fairly low barrier for folks who are in the public, um, who may not be familiar with the artist, who may not be familiar with the clip at all, um, to gain the kind of knowledge from the episode itself. Um, but we also, of course, point to resources outside of that. Um, and this is, here's an example of one of our uh, episodes where we've selected a tape um, by a reading by Sharon Thiessen from 1986. Um, and what we've done is we've actually invited Sharon Thiessen to come back um, to the podcast. She's one of the listeners to her own clip, um, to her own tape. And um, Amy Thiessen, who's an honors English student and a guest curator on the show, um, has her honors thesis is on Sharon Thiessen. And so we construct, um, we construct the podcast around the student curator, um, the two guests, and uh, my co-producer, Nur Salam, as well. Um, finally, the last example um, I have here is a new project that involves um, Felicity Taylor, Marjorie Mitchell, and a PhD student here in, in our Digital Arts and Humanities program, Alam Bavi. Um, and it's a research creation project um, called Making Research Data Public Through Exhibition and Installation that's specifically engaging with rights issues. And so how to make research data public or how we might make research data public through remediation, um, exhibition, installation, uh, when we can't do playback, we can't do a public playback of the, of the recordings. Um, and so in this case, Alam Bavi is working with a, um, a poem by Daphne Marlatt and she's 3D printing it. Um, she's 3D printing the uh, first section of the poem called, uh, from Leaf Leafs. And so this is the prototype on the right here where she's um, drawn on the uh, resin printer or the 3D printer at um, our um, makerspace. Um, and finally, all of the research creation work will point back to the Sandbox Collection website, which um, right now is sort of in its beta stage. Um, it's 
uh, shows just some uh, selected featured writers and featured clips, um, but we're in the process of developing it um, over the next year so that it will have um, as many of, of the clips of, of recordings that we can have with the rights cleared. Um, and my hope is to make them downloadable so that um, people will be able to, artists, uh, profs, writers will be able to work with them. And that's it. Thank you very much. Hi, Karis. Thank you so much for that overview of the all the activities at the at the AMP Lab. And I, I really especially um, appreciate your focus on the student activities uh, and how integrated they are with uh, with all of the work that it takes to to uh, to bring this kind of large scale DH project into uh, into fruition and to do the the necessary curation both on a technical data side but also in a creative uh, space as well. Um, I'm going to pass the mic to Matthew now, and uh, I think we're going to hear a little bit more about labor in DH projects. <laughs> Over Thank to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, let me make sure I can get my slide shared. All right. Are those showing up all right for everyone? We have your notes. There we go. Let's try this. <laughs> about now? Yeah, full screen. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, thanks again for the introduction and for these uh, interesting talks. Um, it started out as quick remarks about uh, one particular project, um, but it soon turned into a bit of a polemic about uh, DH data and labor, um, more than I can say in 15 minutes. So I hope it's just going to raise some questions for people and we can discuss it throughout uh, today and next week. Um, when I say DH and when I say data complexity, uh, what I'm really talking about is what are the kinds of knowledge that we have that is situated, that's uncertain, approximated, inferred, uh, everything that doesn't easily fit into the sort of, you know, spreadsheet-like corporate idea of what data about people or books or artworks and all of our other focuses, things that don't quite fit into that model. Um, and a kind of context for this, these thoughts started actually about six years ago when I was um, still a PhD student. Uh, I had the joy of attending Keystone DH. Uh, this is a regional conference that's held in the state of Pennsylvania here in the US uh, every couple of years. Um, and in 2015, Miriam Posner from UCLA was giving the keynote talk uh, on what she referred to as uh, the radical unrealized potential of digital humanities. And what she did in this talk, and I include a link that I really encourage you to go read this, is she was challenging us to think about what are the more nuanced and complex data models that don't approach uh, attributes uh, and identities like gender or race as a kind of like a, you know, a drop down menu where you select one thing and it applies to one person, but instead as a situated perspective, right? Something that can vary based on uh, the time or the place or the observer. Uh, and I include a bit of a poll quote here, uh, but really her major point was, um, you know, when we're thinking about these, uh, she says, perhaps it makes more sense to define race not as a data point in itself, um, but as the product of a set of relationships of power. In that sense, it's both imagine and imaginary and constitutive of our reality. Uh, is there a data model, she asked, or a set of functions that we might define that could represent that? Um, at the time I was you know, an art historian who was gradually stepping into questions about cultural heritage data modeling, and I found Posner's talk exhilarating, and it really gave me incentive to learn more about these processes of data modeling. Um, and it was probably one of the key points that started turning me from being a you know, very traditional, pure art historian um, into someone who really became interested in the engineering of cultural data and its architecture. Um, because what I learned was that there really are ways to program these concepts in a computable way. Uh, in a way that goes beyond the arbitrary restrictions of you know, a single spreadsheet uh, where you pick a drop down menu. Um, and, but this is kind of lies the road of my talk here. Um, because embedded in the decision to add more complexity, to add more nuance, to add multivalence to data is also a decision to invest uh, labor at many uh, additional levels, right? Um, and I'm not saying this to dissuade the use of complexity. Um, as I hope to demonstrate, the labor and results are often deeply rewarding. Um, but I think that even some very experienced uh, data and digital humanities practitioners can sometimes elide the kinds of labor that are affected by these decisions. 
Um, I suspect many people here uh, are aware of the labor of data entry, of reconciliation, of verification. Um, I hope that when you do think about that, you're thinking about the ways that this labor can be uh, fairly or unfairly distributed. Um, on the right hand side here, I'm showing a picture of uh, largely uncredited punch card operators for uh, Father Roberto Busa's famous Index Thomisticus. Um, this is a common example of early pejorative feminization of data entry work um, in the earliest history of digital humanities. Um, and this was recently illuminated by Melissa Terrace and Julian Nyhan. But what I want to talk about in this talk and in the case study I show is that there are additional kinds of labor that come when you try to increase the complexity of your data. Um, there's the increased labor of designing that data schema and documenting processes and rationales for your team. Why are we doing it this way? Uh, how do we enter this more complex data? Um, when you add that more complexity, that filters out to everyone else on the team. From this view of the technologist, which is the view that I have these days, um, it's the labor of implementing that database and its interfaces and software. Um, so this can be the underlying database, this can be a website uh, that is used to uh, edit that data, to search and view and read that data, um, and uh, the, the need to continually update and change things as the research project evolves, as the, research, uh, as the researchers kind of change their minds about what they want to study. And this is, again, an added source of labor that comes with more complexity. Um, the complexity hits the researchers as well. Uh, in order to analyze these results, to ask questions of it, to run queries on it, the more complex your data are, the more difficult it is. Uh, you need to write more code, you need to click more times, you need to assemble more tables, you need to make more visualizations. Um, but finally, and I think most importantly for this workshop, um, there's an increased labor that you then demand of your communities uh, and your audiences uh, when you publish data that's more complex. Um, it's more labor for people to then try and understand that data, to reuse that data. So the case study that I want to talk about here is, um, it's actually a bit of a meta study since we're talking about DH, as the Index of Digital Humanities Conferences. Um, this was edited by uh, Scott Weingart, um, who had formerly been at Carnegie Mellon. He's now at the University of Notre Dame. Um, and Nicole Eichmann-Kalwara uh, from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, uh, and it was coded and constructed by myself. Uh, the index is an attempt to collate a growing database, this is living, it's expanding, um, of digital humanities and humanities computing conference programs and presentation abstracts uh, dating back to the early days of academic computing uh, we have in the 60s and early 70s. Um, we launched this in fall of 2020, um, but the index is very much a work in progress. Um, the screenshot actually that I'm showing you here is out of date. The numbers have changed. The people have been adding more data to it since. Um, and I strongly recommend uh, you read the about pages uh, to get a fuller sense of the full motivations behind it um, and also what is and importantly, what is not yet contained within it. Um, what I'm going to be focusing on is one little uh, affordance of the system that we built to try and illustrate these multivalent properties of complex data. So um, one of our goals, we wanted to be able to look at, connect papers together that were by the same author um, so that we could look at uh, the influences of particular people, the influences of the institutions on these larger discourses around digital humanities through conferences and, and events. Um, while doing that connection, we still wanted to maintain the original variations of names. We wanted to maintain what institution did they say they were at when uh, they submitted this abstract um, and the connections of each of those assertions back to the original source materials. Um, so here, for example, you see a panel from uh, the 2019 Keystone DH conference, uh, where one of the uh, presenters, Dr. Zoe Blanc, at the time gave an affiliation at the University of Virginia. Now, if we go forward to Dr. LeBlanc's page, uh, you can see that all of the linked works that we have indexed in here um, are there, along with a list of all the varied names and affiliations that she's given uh, across these different works. So rather than going in and normalizing all of our author names, uh, we maintained them as given in the source materials, uh, linking together presentations when we were confident they, that they were by the same author. Uh, and you'll see this lets us show these different variations. And then you, know, you can click back through and see well, what work was that from, what conference, where did that information come from? 
Uh, already this introduces complexity actually just in doing the website, right? Um, you see a person's web page and suddenly you're seeing there's more boxes, there's more hyperlinks, there's more text on the page. It may look more complex than you might have suspected at first. Um, but this increased data complexity had a direct impact on uh, the data entry workflow um, for our project team. It included a lot of additional time spent uh, training um, both ourselves uh, as well as student workers uh, who were uh, participating in this project, um, and then troubleshooting with those workers. Uh, a lot of more time spent uh, on my end customizing data entry interfaces. Uh, so what you see on the right-hand side, you'll never see as a public user, but uh, we had to work on a long time to make sure that uh, for the researchers and the student workers who are entering data on this, um, that they could you know, use it in an efficient manner. So again, more time invested at this front end. Um, it also means a lot of additional developer time, technology time, uh, configuring a database and a web application where author names as well as affiliations aren't just properties of a person, you know, a, a thing that you look up in a table in a spreadsheet, but are assertions made by specific conferences and specific at specific points in time. Um, so this is a diagram. Again, you can read more about this on uh, the published website, but uh, in the case of, say, the author here, Jane Doe, uh, who has an ID as a person in our database, um, they aren't directly linked to uh, an appellation of Jane Doe. Instead, they're connected to those names by uh, an authorship on a particular work that was presented at a particular conference. And in that authorship, they give a name, they may give a particular institution. This is the, what has to happen in the database to allow us to give that complex view into the uh, data that we're indexing and, made, and making searchable. Um, this means I couldn't use straightforward queries. Uh, this is an example of SQL, uh, which is, stands for Structured Query Language. Uh, it's a language that's used in many common databases. Um, a simple query like this is meant to work on a single table, but we had many, many interlinked tables. So it literally means more programming time, or literally more lines of code to go through, uh, chain together from tables to get from a person to authorships to appellations and increasing the time it takes to write the code, increasing the time it takes to check the code, uh, to update it when our goals change or our affordances or needs change. And what I want to reiterate here, you know, adding all of this added complexity, uh, it isn't inherently bad, right? Uh, in fact, because I had adequate time to explore our options and because I was vested with uh, adequate authority in the project to have my recommendations followed and respected, this actually became a very rewarding, um, both sort of historical enterprise and a software design challenge. Um, however, if it weren't for that close collaborative relationship between myself and the project uh, researchers, this complexity would have been alienating. Instead, it would have been a burden separating me from the uh, eventual product of all of our work. But perhaps most importantly, as I said, uh, creating more complex data results in more labor for our audiences as well. So um, on the far right hand side of the screen, uh, you'll see this is a sort of very long screen cap of the very long web page we have that documents here's all of the data that's included in this database, uh, which people may download and reuse and edit. Um, this documentation runs many pages long. Uh, it raises a barrier for those who might want to reuse that data. Uh, it requires them to take more time to understand what did we make? How do these pieces fit together? How does this function? And why did we do this, right? So there's a cognitive labor increase and demand on our audiences as well. So I hope in the subtext of each of these examples, you've noticed that this added labor, when it was structured and accounted for, resulted not only in a more nuanced data product, but actually resulted in uh, what I think was a richer experience for the project team as a whole, and we hope a richer experience for our audiences. Um, yes, this more complex data meant it took longer for people to enter the data, more nuanced data entry. Um, but what this also meant was uh, the worker, the students who were working on this project, uh, they weren't really being paid to enter data. Uh, they were being paid and gaining experience in critical engagement with these source materials. Um, they were learning bibliographic skills, research skills, um, search and discovery skills as they worked through this project. You know, yes, we had to spend more time planning and justifying our database and oftentimes going back to do revisions, uh, but this in turn meant more critical thought about the project ahead of time um, and really fundamentally altered the scope 
and motivations of this project and really made us focus in on what our ultimate goals were. Uh, you know, yes, it meant more technologist time coding and putting together the platform. It took more researcher time to then analyze this data afterwards. Um, but this also results in a much richer uh, engagement between uh, the technologists on the team like myself and the historians, Scott and Nicole, as collaborators, right? Not just as a sort of, uh, you know, client service model. And finally, you know, yes, the data are less easily to be reused. Um, however, we hope that with our documentation and with our kind of added narrative behind why we were doing this, why the data looks this way, that people who come to reuse this data uh, won't blindly go in and just, you know, take, oh, I want to do the full text and I want to see everything, that they'll have more attention to the thoughtful documentation, um, more attention to our explanations, and more attention to our audiences. So uh, that's my short case study. Um, I'd like people to keep these ideas in mind. Um, I've included a list of some references, both through what I mentioned in the talk, as well as a couple of other uh, in important articles on data modeling and thinking through labor. Um, but uh, I encourage you to visit this resource um, and uh, ask me questions either on Twitter or uh, during the conference and workshop for the rest of the day today. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much um, for that deep dive into uh, all of the labor that it takes to create highly complex data um, uh, uh, and what that means, uh, you know, to an equity lens to a certain degree. Thank you so much, Connie. Uh, yes, Connie sent us a recording. There is a little bit of a delay, so we're starting it uh, from the screen sharing portion. Uh, we're so very excited to feature this as well. Ten minutes. I want to talk about the Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada project, some of our um, uh, data management successes and uh, failures, and some of our future plans. There's some of the things I'd like to talk through, both sort of like the history of data circulation in queer circles, um, as well as how we've come to think about um, our own circulation and uh, the ways in which uh, circulation is not preservation. So, you know, what is the best way um, to make sure we're preserving our data as well? The Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada project um, is built out of two print chronologies by our colleague, Don McLeod. Uh, and his work consists of two print volumes uh, with events, uh, the places they took place in, the dates that they took place at, and uh, the citations for the records that he consulted in order to create this material. Uh, my research partner, Michelle Schwartz and I, who co-direct the digital part of the Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada project together, um, approached Don uh, in 2010 and said, oh no, uh, this is just asking to be sort of digitized, to be represented as a database or in sort of some other way, could we work with your text? Um, and Don, much to our good fortune, uh, gave us permission. Uh, his work really is part of a like long history of uh, queer activist record keeping. He started the two print volumes because he found when working in the archives that there were lots of young researchers, you know, coming through in the 1990s who didn't necessarily know the queer history um, of even something as recent as like two decades beforehand. Um, and there's a long history of uh, queer activists bringing together this sort of proof of life circulating um, lists of texts and of events to communicate to a future generation uh, that uh, lesbian and gay life you know has been possible has looked a particular way that queer futures um, are also popular so we're very much sort of inspired by Jeanette Howard Foster who was the author of sex variant women in literature looking at uh, women's um, uh, writing and writing about uh, women, um, as well as uh, the lesbian in literature, um, a, bio, a bibliography uh, by variants of Bradley and Barbara Greer. Um, that looks like this, little reviews of each text, um, as well as uh, work of the 1970s that was bringing together bibliographies uh, writ large to sort of prove um, uh, that lesbians have existed in, uh, in history. Um, and that there's a real sort of goal there, as Joan Nessel from the Lesbian Her Her Story Archive says, to change deprivation into cultural plentitude to communicate um, forward this queer history. So the Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada's sort of digital project uh, involves at its core the creation of um, XML files. Uh, we've marked up Don's text using TEI 
um, XML. It's been very useful for us in that John said even as he was, you know, creating um, all these event records uh, on cue cards by going to archives um, around North America, even he didn't really know how many events he had, how many people were the text. Uh, the markup has let us sort of reconcile, um, you know, uh, people's names with their stage names, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so now we know that he had 3,100 events and uh, roughly 2,000 people listed in these two books. You can see some of our markup here on the right-hand side. And certainly, TEI XML was sort of part of our preservation strategy from the first. These are very lightweight files. They are platform um, agnostic. We could, they're human readable. We could print them out on microfiche and bury them, you know, in the ground, uh, you know, and hope that they would be there in um, in 500 years. But beyond sort of knowing that we had chosen a format that was not platform de dependent and, and would continue to be um, human readable, uh, when we started in 2011 encoding sort of Michelle and I and uh, a Dropbox account and some software, you know, software license, um, uh, we hadn't sort of thought beyond that stage. Uh, the project has grown in the intervening years. Um, a lot of the sort of intellectual effort of the project has been to, to build uh, out and around uh, Don's original text. I uh, had the good fortune in 2014 of getting funding from Shirk, and so now we get to move a lot faster and work with um, a wonderful group of students um, to do both archival research as well as sort of the digital side of things. Uh, so we've gone from uh, his original 3,100 events to 34,000 records um, about the people, the periodicals, um, the um, uh, the places all listed um, in that original text. A lot of that coming from um, various archival sources. Uh, we've worked with the TIs, our code base, and then have converted it out into various formats, things to do, uh, things like being able to count you know, sort of now and, and being able to create um, charts and graphs and things that we might need for um, period for um, uh, articles uh, and conference presentations, uh, but also trying to like tap into that, uh, making queer history more visible, sort of more available. Um, we also converted the TEI out into uh, a graph database in order to put up a web app uh, that lets people visit lglc.ca and search through and read, um, we hope, some of their own history there. One of the great pleasures of the project um, has been in, in finding that uh, gay liberation happened everywhere. It's not just an urban phenomena or uh, like a men's phenomena, but rather something that um, uh, that happens sort of more broadly. And the current development and production database and site um, are housed by the Ryerson University Library Collaboratory. Um, which has has been a wonderful relationship. Uh, we also have you know ancillary files related to the project keys, uh, you know in CSV form where we're keeping um, a lot of our content. And we've just started um, to think through uh, converting our content to link data as well to link our projects to other ones. We have lots of records about like what Pierre Elliott Trudeau was up to um, in the 60s and 70s, and about you know Margaret Atwood's. Uh, um, activist uh, work, for example, that could really, uh, we think, feed productively into other political history and um, uh, literary projects. Now, we did have, uh, you know, sort of these uh, like plans for preservation from the first. Um, Michelle and I presented on the project in 2011 um, at the Canadian Society for Digital Humanities and had the good fortune of being approached by Susan Brown from the Canadian Research Writing Collaboratory to say, hey, we're building out this um, Canadian literary um, research space and digital project. Um, this would be a great home for your, your uh, uh, TI if you're you know, inclined to, to join. Um, we were delighted and did and um, uh, and then had the chance to work with them too on on things like questions of uh, both you know, interface but also you know how to represent personhood digitally and and how to think through um, some of those larger issues uh, that the plan for cork was is for all the data in cork to be housed by the University of Alberta libraries we've now also started to think through though uh, now that there are you know more sort of like national repositories online things like Portage, uh, how should we be contributing our data there? Uh, 
our data is, you know, getting tidier and tidier, and we're coming up to some of those like milestones where it might make sense to be preserving um, this material. We have a takedown notice on our website, so in case people find mentions of themselves that they would like, you know, sort of taken down, um, we have a way of sort of uh, um, arbitrating that, you know, so we don't want to sort of commit to these repositories anything that folks might not want um, uh, on the web. We've had one takedown request in four years, but. This, this sort of steps are there. Uh, and um, and so, you know, we're now thinking through like the TI is a good preservation format. It might not be suitable for portage. Does it make more sense for us to be pulling CSVs and creating, you know, keys that describe what's kind of happening in our data set um, to contribute it that way? We too are attached to this like queer history of circulating information about like a queer literature or circulating even information about bibliographies so that people know that these bibliographies exist. Um, uh, and we think that uh, linked data can also provide us with, uh, with some help there. Um, and so we're working with two linked data projects, uh, Nano History um, uh, run by Matt Milner and Links uh, run by Susan Brown, uh, which is about uh, creating ways to connect disparate and often peer reviewed data sets and to, to create sort of more highly connected uh, uh, data here. And so our hope too is that, um, well, circulation itself isn't a preservation technique, except in the historical sense of like people, the history only lives as long as it lives on in us. And we know that it was possible to live in all these various ways that may not even be possible now because we know that history, which is some of that, you know, work that, Zimmer, Bradley, and, um, and then Faderman are sort of pointing to, um, but also knowing that like circulation isn't the same as preservation in the research data management um, sense. And so not only sort of thinking, we're not only sort of thinking through how best to contribute our data to um, something like Portage, but also by contributing to links and then working with the links team on preservation strategies for um, their triple store in the long term, you know, how to preserve this important Canadian data that spans many projects um, is an important part of our next steps. So I will look forward to the Q&A, um, but also um, to the larger primer writing um, initiative that we'll all be taking part in tomorrow. Uh, and indeed, uh, don't hesitate to be in touch. So uh, thank you, Connie, for the uh, pre-recorded video um, that you shared with us. Great. Uh, thank you again, Felicity, and thank you, Chantelle. And I'll rely on you to let me know if my audio or video cuts out uh, again, Felicity. Um, I was mentioning that the genesis of this archive project, the Indigenous Digital Art Archive, um, which came from um, a relationship with the great Ganigehage artist, Scalinati, um, who I approached to develop some research in my, in my PhD. And Scalinati and I worked together really closely uh, in large part because this area that I researched, Indigenous digital art, is so poorly documented. Okay, so the histories are not written, but archives have really only just begun to think through the unique challenges of working at this intersection of digital media and Indigenous cultural content. And so uh, for this reason, Skawanadi and her collaborator, who you see uh, here, uh, uh, collaborator and partner, Jason Edward Lewis, brought me into their uh, exciting world um, as a non-Indigenous scholar to collaborate with them on a number of projects now with the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, which is a, a seven-year SHRC-funded partnership grant that they organize with far-reaching aims to support diverse Indigenous art and media projects, including a mandate to develop uh, archival research. So this is a project that I'll share with you. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we have begun to think through um, management of our digital assets. Our archive project is in its early stages, but for the last several years has been a really exciting vehicle to think through uh, some of the different strategies for preservation, emulation, and access of born digital artworks made by Indigenous artists. Uh, the project has also been a platform for some consultation and discursive activities bringing the voices of others who likewise have been thinking about this stuff. Uh, so so I'll, I'll briefly relay some points uh, from those conversations today as well. 
the archive itself is based around Jason and Scalinati's personal holdings. It's a, a wealth of material, both physical and digital, produced by the two through their own practices as artists, but also as facilitators and curators over several decades. So the archive itself represents dozens and dozens of Indigenous artists working in digital media. It's, it's a, really a treasure trove, a tremendous research resource um, that, that we're working to open up for access. The physical archive itself is about 15 linear feet of flat materials, but we also have something like 20 terabytes of data. It's a, quite a bit of born digital materials. And this represents a huge range of media video installations, virtual reality artworks, net art, software, video games, and online worlds, as well as administrative and descriptive materials for all of these. There are also significant elements of social history around these different projects, all of which were born out of collaborations, community consultation, or education. So that's a significant component to these materials as well. We have, I think, uh, uh, very likely the best collection of materials representing contemporary digital art made by Indigenous artists, uh, certainly within Canada, but, but perhaps internationally as well. Members of the Initiative for Indigenous Futures had already begun archival discussions before I showed up, but our archive project formalized when I was invited uh, together with the curator, uh, Sarah England, to do some curatorial work with Jason and Scalinati for their 2017 retrospective at Montreal's Ellen Art Gallery. And here you're seeing a few installation shots showing a range both of the kind of media used, touch screens, virtual reality, video games, but also a range of collaborators. Again, many artists are represented here. And as a component of this exhibition, we included a selection of archival materials. And, and as the archivist attending today will appreciate Scalinati has really never thrown anything out. Um, so for this exhibition, we were able to compile archival materials related to the exhibited artworks, uh, which again, over 20 years of art making by dozens of artists. It was here in this archive space that we shared a version of Cyber Pow Wow. Cyber Pow Wow was a hugely significant platform that involved um, 24 artists, writers, curators, each of whom have uh, really become prominent figures in contemporary art in Canada. It was a large scale, ambitious, community driven project that ran from 1997 to 2008. To date, it's the largest platform for internet based art made by Indigenous artists. Um, and pointedly, the project emerged from a really significant political context of Indigenous activism and cultural resurgence in the 1990s. So alongside the related archival materials, as you see, um, you can actually sit down and engage with this rather old piece of new media. Uh, that, that's what you see in the top left of the slide, the actual piece. And we accomplished this through a rather finicky balancing act of emulation with files written in the 1990s on a Macintosh running on an offline hacked piece of server software that last ran on Windows XP, which were running virtually from a disk on this iMac G4 from 20 years ago. Okay, so in other words, we emulated this old new media with the in intention of establishing some sort of historicity in, in the display of the archive space, which would cue the context of social and political activity that the artwork emerged from. Cyber Pow Wow arguably made its greatest impacts through its live components, those social processes and relationships that manifested both online and offline with largely indigenous audiences uh, who largely were using network media for the first time. And so our archival ambitions aim to simultaneously document those social processes primary to the project and at the same time make available the range of media objects produced by the represented artists. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sharing this case study within the archive um, um, as it grew out of the exhibition because it prompted some of the first steps in thinking through how certain archival processes uh, might better uh, account for contemporary Indigenous art and artists. Um, and so in the remainder of the time, I'll just, I'll just lay out some of the ways in which uh, we've begun thinking of this through our own research and experimentation, uh, as well as through consultation. I, I would also like to stress for those who might not be fully aware of the pressing need for better archival processes that respond to ongoing calls to decolonize and indigenize archives. 
This has been called for in recent years at the highest levels, including the United Nations Declaration on the Right of Indigenous Peoples and the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, right? both of which have called for reformation of archival practices toward consultation and collaboration and reconciliation and away from certain morally bankrupt traditions of extraction, ownership, and possession. Uh, and as some of you, I'm sure, are aware of, there are big initiatives um, um, in movement at present to respond to these calls. At, at, at the highest level, the Canadian Association of Archivists has their reconciliation framework for Canadian archives. Canadian Federation of Library Association has a committee on Indigenous matters. But also at smaller organizations, smaller archives and libraries and museums have done uh, important work with their data practices as well. Uh, so this is um, part of the uh, community that, that we wish to be engaged with. Um, people who are thinking of um, leading with the, the First Nation principles of OCAP, that is ownership, control, access, and possession. So measures that give authority to Indigenous peoples to determine how data by and about them should be managed. At the same time, uh, there are several significant developments that have been made to work with culturally specific digital content. And, and I'll briefly share uh, this project, Mercutu. It's a content management system built with Waramangu community members in the Northern Territory of Australia, which gives us a really rich model of how digital assets might be organized around a set of cultural principles so that access to archival items appropriately corresponds to cultural protocols. Um, in this case, um, archival items can be viewed only when a set of cultural variables are met. So who you are, where you're from, who you know, um, what your relationship is uh, to the item uh, can then dictate how you access that item in various ways. And the platform then allows for users to share stories, uh, to identify family members, uh, to address an item's sacred status, and set uh, restrictions for other users. So this platform has been utilized uh, for other archives that have uh, other culturally specific needs, including one in Canada I know of is GRASAC, that's the Great Lakes Research Alliance for the Study of Aboriginal Arts and Culture, which implemented Mercutu to reflect Haudenosaunee values, uh, which differ in many ways from Waramangu protocols, um, but efforts were made to develop a system uh, for their own needs. And there are many comparable initiatives of, of others who are doing this. Karis mentioned the uh, indigitization group in BC that also develops community-based tools for information management. In our case, for an archive that exclusively represents contemporary art, mostly by living artists, um, we have no sacred objects exactly, though we do have uh, items related to traditional and familial knowledge, and we have stories that are gifted from knowledge holders. Um, we have a different set of needs than these examples, but uh, th th these are some of the initiatives that, we, that we're in dialogue with um, as we develop our own platform for our holdings. Um, this concern for bringing together perspectives at the intersection of Indigenous art and digital archives prompted us to host a gathering in the spring of 2019. And here you see pictured the event's keynote. Uh, it's the Taltan archive scholar Camille Callison, Dragon Espensheed, the artist and leading uh, preservationist of digital art, and Dr. Sherry farrell Reset, the great Métis art historian, each of whom spoke expertly with us about uh, pressing concerns from their own informed perspective. And they did so after a closed round table of about uh, 20 scholars, artists, and archivists who we invited, Felicity was there, uh, for a studied consultation about archiving Indigenous digital art. Wonderful uh, discussions came out of this group, and we've produced a, a report which details some of the group's findings um, that I'll just mention briefly now. We recognize it as a group that, uh, that Indigenous art archives are vital for the building of Indigenous art histories and for transmitting cultural knowledge. And also we recognize, unfortunately, archives largely underrepresent Indigenous art. And when they do, their metadata often fail to reflect the cultural and social contexts 
of, of these art practices. Um, and so at risk here is that archives really undermine indigenous ways of thinking and being in the world. Relatedly, we also discussed how existing archives that do represent indigenous art face issues with management and accessibility. And so these concerns should be addressed in strategies that the group noted should be indigenous led, but would also require the support of broader communities of people and organizations. Uh, and so being a non-Indigenous partner here means being engaged in an ongoing process of consultation and building trust and working towards respect and uh, reciprocity. I, I think I'll skip this. I feel like I'm going long, but some of our plans to develop um, uh, the archive itself. Just reiterating, closing that um, we're in the process of imagining how uh, flexible archival tools and practices can be built upon reciprocity and consultation and collaboration. And we can imagine certain structures that, for example, make available the original files of uh, cyber powwow, for example, uh, that also contextualize these with documentation and ephemera and literature and so forth uh, to better represent how significant these artworks are uh, uh, within context of self-determination and activism. Um, so we started to ask ourselves some questions about, for example, what would an indigenous digital stewardship life cycle look like? Um, and then how might these differ from a variety of indigenous cultural perspectives? How might metadata and classification standards specific to community partners allow for others uh, to, to have stakes in our arch archive in ways that make room for cultural knowledge? So this begins to get at the larger question then of what kind of roles an archive might be able to have its social implications uh, when we're concerned not just about the storage and preservation of objects, but about nurturing relationships, caring for cultural narratives, and for activating and collaborating in processes of knowledge production. So, uh, I, I hope you heard all of that, and thank you for listening to me if you could. <laughs>